Chad Johansson. What's up, buddy? Welcome to the Fiduciary You podcast. I'm finally glad that we uh, were able to nail down a date. I'm like super pumped to talk to you. Yeah, that's that's my fault. I mean, you sent the the link a few times and I backed. I was terrified. Let's put it that way. I was so scared to sit on Fiduciary You that I backed out a number of times. No, it's I'm, I'm it's not for your fault, man. It's like, you know, I know it. It's, it was it was easy. It was easier to, for me to get my wife to uh, convince my wife to marry me. And actually, <laughs> you say yes to being off of this year. Hey, no, I said yes. I said you yes. Said the calendar is just so full, it's hard to align the schedule. When you're big time like you are, that's just kind of what Oh, jeez. I, I know my role. I know my role. So, oh, goodness. Um, I'm pumped to be here with you, though. Looking forward to a good discussion. We're going to have fun. You are um, by far one of, my, uh, one of my favorite people within this industry. and, and um, Appreciate you. You know, there's a lot of folks that, that – you know, I, I think that, the, and I think anybody who watches this retire holics, I know JD would probably describe it this way: is I think you're one of the one of the smartest folks in the industry. Really, really good at, at um, certainly as a technician, but also just being able to speak at a really deep level on lots of topics. What I would consider to be kind of second, third, fourth level thinking. Not you know, a lot of people can can have a conversation around first level thinking issues, but um, you know, you've always, you take it, you take it deeper. So we're going to have a good time and we're going to focus the thrust of this conversation, um, maybe a little bit different than um, traditionally, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the folks that I speak to on the industry are, you know, focusing probably more, uh, maybe their experience is more mid to large markets. Um, you guys have carved out a really, really good niche and where you guys focus, um, not exclusively, but Kind of the core is really that probably zero to five million dollar market, and I think whether yeah. you're an advisory firm, a TPA, it's really important to figure out like where's your core market, where's your niche, and then throw gasoline on that fire. and And we're going to be talking about you know topics that you know are prevalent maybe more in the smaller end of the market um, because it is a different clients are different the way advisors go to market, the way TPAs go to market are different in that mm -hmm. sub $5 million space. Um, practices, principles, all of that is, you know, the same, I think, across the market, but how you implement that is different in different segments. And so this will be a cool conversation to really focus and help listeners that maybe play and fish in that, you know, that, that, that smaller end of the pond. Well, and I, I mean, I think we've seen it already in the industry, the buzzword being convergence and, advisors looking at going down market, supporting even startups. You've heard us discuss on the show a whole bunch, 401k focused advisors saying, I want to take on the startup because it's a relationship that comes to me from a, a powerhouse referral source and they need to find a way to scale it and be profitable in that space. So yeah, I, I do focus in the micro space. I tend to work with advisors that don't have a, a core competency in 401k, but I'm, we're doing more and more each and every month with advisors who are up market that are yeah. saying, hey, I'm going to come down market. I'm going to charge for our services and I'm going to deliver a high end package to my client, even though there's no plan in place right now and there's no asset. So I think it'll blend well for your audience. No, I think that's I think that's great. So so help listeners kind of understand um, or, and help me maybe understand. We we had, I mean, I had some plans that were in that, you know, call it two to five million dollar space. It wasn't a core focus for us. Maybe some of the advisors on my team that were just starting out, you know, when they come across those plans, and we had built our service model to be able to 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 support that. But it was a different, you know, the lift. You just you you can't charge the fees. In this really smaller end of that, you could still, I, you know, I would say if I was going to start an advisory business today, like I would probably focus ex exclusively in the under $10 million market. There's just so many more plans. 98% mm -hmm. of plans are probably under $10 million, $15 million. A lot of them are a disaster and a train wreck. There's a lot less really good advisors that are out there. They're just, you know, we talked earlier before we started recording about like, fishing in a stocked pond, like there's just a lot of opportunity out there. So when you think about that market, what would you say are the biggest issues that plan sponsors are dealing with that advisors need to really um, address and figure out? Yeah, I, 
I'll answer that very simply. The biggest issue in that space is you have an HR generalist. You have a CFO generalist. You have a person who's wearing many hats in that space. And often mm -hmm. time, effort, and intelligence in the 401k arena is just not there. And I don't blame them for that. They've got to run a business. And so it, where advisors need to bridge that gap is to really bring together a team that can be an educational resource for those people. I know for years, we've just looked at this as outsource, outsource, outsource. Get somebody else who knows how to do this for you. Great payroll integration, which I'm a big believer in. But I'm, I'm setting my flag in the ground saying, if we continue to just service and not educate, then the same problems are going to be there for us five years from now and 10 years from now. We need to come up with a way to efficiently help these HR, these CFOs, these executives that are running the Microspace 401k plan. And we need to do so by making sure that they better understand their obligations, their responsibilities, and how these plans operate. To give you the big, biggest example, Josh, I have not ran in, in my entire career talking, I've brought on probably close to 2,000 401k plans. In my entire career, I've not run into one client that truly understands the definition of compensation. Not one, not one time. Right. And so I think that telling them, oh, go read some IRS language of what compensation means. Oh, refer to your adoption agreement to see what you are including or not, not including as the definition. That doesn't help them. We need to change the terminology. We need to educate them. We need to have ways, I think you have, or I know you have a way of educating plan sponsors on these terms and the plans and the operations. Um, we need to do a better job at that in the micro space. Yeah. Yeah, even definition of comp, even making it simple. Like, you know, a lot of times, it was funny, I had a larger plan. Um, so, so what I would say is like, even up market, a lot of times they don't know what definition of comp is. And it was funny, like I, I, um, I had a client, it was a large, but it was like a, not a large, it was a mid, maybe like $70 million plan super profitable company, um, you know, did a few hundred million dollars a year in revenue, um, single owner actually just sold it for like $2 billion or some crazy number. Um, but what he did, this was probably like 2016, 17 is as a reward, he had probably 1200 employees. He took every, the entire company down to the oh, Caribbean. That's awesome. Um, it was awesome. I, and, and the number, it was like $4 million. And what they did was they paid for everybody and, um, to go. And what they did is they just basically gave them a bonus, grossed it up for taxes and the net, uh, would cover the cost of them being able to pay for, it, pay for it. And so they're telling me all about this and I'm talking to the CFO and, and super smart guy, but he, he was still like, even 401k wise, like, you know, he kind of didn't know what he didn't know. And he's telling me about all of this. And as he's telling me, I'm like, dude, that's awesome. And then I was like, well, how, how are you doing? He told me how they were going to pay it. And I was like, when, when, when is that hitting? And he's like, you know, in a few like weeks. And I'm like, we need to amend your plan. And he's like, why? And I was like, you don't want this $4 million in additional comp in your definition of compensation. He's like, what the heck Interesting. do you need? And I'm like, if this is in your definition, like if you, you might be liable, like I'm sure the owner doesn't want to pay, you know, a match on yeah. this bonus. And he's like, no, no. Didn't extrapolate no, that's, that that's expense no, out. Yeah. No, we've got the budget for it. Dang. <laughs> We like hustle and wound up like, you know, getting like an amendment and kind of like excluding and carving. But to, you, to your point, that was even a big company. And they had a lot of times, like you said, they just, you know, and, and why would they know? Like, it's just, it's, it's really, really complex. And I couldn't agree with you more around, you know, educating clients and, and um, you're right. It's a, and, and even, and, and with small companies, like we can't expect them. You know, we can't we expect don't them want to be them to experts. Be experts. For all make the fear that clear. Model. We don't want them to be experts, but they need to have enough understanding to run their plan because they are indeed in charge and carry the liability for right. running that plan. Even if we outsource it, they still need to know how to research and determine if the 316 is doing what they need to do. Let me make one point, though, on a comment. Yeah. They, need enough, they, they need to be have enough expertise to know what they don't know and then know how to hire the right person right. 
who can bring that. And it is in my opinion that the advisor should them. be that person. I don't think it should be the TPA. I don't. I think the advisor should be the catalyst that maybe brings those subcontractors to the table. But I would like to see the advisor community control that relationship. You you made a point that uh, that I, yeah. I I don't think it's talked about enough in terms of servicing the micro space. You mentioned that this client sold the business and he did really well. One of my favorite 401k focused advisors out of Cali, a very intelligent human being. And I, I, I ended up asking him after five or six years of working with him why he never goes up market. And he's, he's a private wealth advisor that has a heavy focus in 401k and does a really good job. And he said, Chad, I can charge the fees I need to charge to be profitable in the micro space. I, I invoice my clients and they get a tax deduction for it and they pay the fee. So I'm good there. I don't need large plans with assets in order to cover what I need to be profitable. He goes, but more importantly for me and my business, my clientele, my business owners sell their companies once every six years. Now, granted, he's in California, in Silicon Valley. It's a little different there. But he says, once every six years, I've got these business owners coming into tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. And he goes, and it just floods my private wealth business because I do such a good job on the 401k. And I make a lot more money on my private wealth than I do on that. For, like, in some ways, I'm happy that that 401k plan goes away because I'm making a lot more revenue now. Well, and and truthfully, it doesn't always go away. Do. Two of his businesses were acquired oh. this year and we remained the TPA and he remained the advisor on them with the larger company because we were so good on what they were currently doing. But think about that from an upmarket advisor that, that is now getting into the private wealth space. They've been 401k focused. They've got a division of their team now. Yeah. Those micro companies, those sub 100 employee companies, they get bought and sold a lot. And those business owners tend to walk into yeah. tens of millions of dollars that they're not used to having. And, and that's a great opportunity to take your expertise from the K yeah. side and, and blend it into the wealth side. Even they walk away with two or three million dollars. That's a great private client. The vast majority of yeah. RAs, like they focus on that their bread and butter is that five hundred thousand to call it three to five million dollars in assets. Three million dollar private client is a great is a great private client. And I think one of the things you, you alluded to early on, like the definition of comp, there's so much fear mongering. It, it, it's funny the the so much fear mongering around fiduciary liability, and you know the reality is. That is a fairly unique to, you know, unless you're committing fraud or embezzlement, like that is an up, 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 up market. I'm not talking like 50 to 100 million. Like you're talking, I mean, Fred or, or Jerome Schlichter that I had on my podcast last year, he said he thought the floor for litigation was $200 million. And, and his whole point yeah. was that the economics you can't make enough money as a plaintiff's attorney because you take these on contingency. You can't make enough money on small plans to cover the cost that you have to outlay to litigate these plans. And so, you know, down market, um, I'd say under 200 million, under 100 million, but absolutely in the micro market, the biggest risk to companies is not liability. If you're an advisor selling on like fiduciary liability to a $5 million plan, then you are totally, quite frankly, one, you don't know what you're talking about, or you're trying to sell on the, the it's like getting struck by lightning. But operational failures are common to every plan. Down market, like you could have a $5 million plan that could run into a easily into the five figures, but a six figure correction if they're not yeah. running their plan correct. That's the bigger risk for micro plans is the cost of fixing operational failures, not the risk of getting sued, which is never going to happen. So accurate and plans. well so put. We, we have engaged ERISA counsel when we onboard a client, because honestly, about 70% of the plans we onboard have mistakes. And some of them you can get around, others you have to fix. Got to go back through the VCP and make corrections. You yeah. got to go back and redo filings. Like Sometimes you just can't get around it. And we're not trying to dig up old trash, but the analogy I often use for folks is you're bringing us on to build a third, a fourth, a fifth story on this building. That's what you're hiring us. You, this, this, the core structure of your plan has already existed for years. And if we do work on top of inaccurate work, then all of our work is inaccurate and we know it. And so we can't build a third, fourth or fifth story then. 
there's, and there's downstream. Yeah, and then there's downstream effects yep. and, and to that. The, the costs you know, get much larger overthink. the longer you wait, especially if the IRS catches you. You get a notice from the IRS and you can no longer go through some of the compliance programs they offer. It gets expensive now. Uh, so, uh, yeah, unfortunately, operational efficiency, operational yep. mistakes is probably the number one thing that I spend education time on with plan sponsors, with committees. Is to say, let's look at what does your employee handbook look like? Yeah. Does it match the adoption agreement? Let's look at how you're, you're creating your match per pay period. Are you matching on all compensation? What is that definition? Those are the things that uh, an ounce prevention is worth a pound of cure. Spend a little bit of time up front and, and keep that client safe on the back end. Unfortunately, in the micro space, that stuff just doesn't get talked about very often. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's not the listeners want to hear this, but like, so, so um, I have a history of colon cancer in my family. So like, I, I have to Something get- Something you love, I'm sure. Um, which is never fun. Oh, it's great, it's great. Um, it, it feels like getting, it, 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 it feels like uh, the physical version <laughs> of getting audited by the IRS. It's, it, um, but colon cancer is pretty much a preventable disease. Like if they go in and they find, like they, they can go in if you, the, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But what happens is if you don't get regularly tested, then when it's a late stage issue, the outcomes yeah. are very, very bad. And so I think that's what you're saying is, hey, let's have a process in place where we can, any IRS or DOL you know, auditor would tell you that there is no perfectly healthy 401k plan. Operational errors happen all the time. If you can find them quickly and you can fix them quickly, then the amount of, 401k chemotherapy that has to, you know, you have to go yeah. through is, is a lot less. So I think a really, really good point. What have you found in terms of, um, you know, I think in that market, you see a lot more of kind of what I would call a three prong team of advisor, TPA mm -hmm. and record keeper, you know, more up market, not to say that there aren't TPAs more up market, but you see a lot more, I would say bundled arrangements there. At least I did kind of in my career. Um, what are you seeing in terms of like different providers and, and like who's doing a good job down market and, and what's the difference between delivering a, a really good solution for a micro plan yeah, versus Let me make a, so a comment solution? that I can't pass up first. Uh, we've been on over a year now creating a bunch of releases with Nevin Adams and the folks at ARA and a number of other TPAs that even a bundled solution has a TPA as well. Even a bundled solution at 500 million has a compliance administrator within the same shop as the record keeper doing the work that my firm does. The difference is you're choosing to keep it under one chassis versus having a specialist in each area. Now we can debate that and talk yeah. about that at some point in time, but I wanna make it known the large plans have a TPA as well. And it's just a bundled TPA. It's not just record keeping. Every plan has record keeping and administration together. It's just, is it all single sourced right. fair, or is it fair. multi -sourced? And even when you that's get fair. in the micro space, almost every record keeper has a bundled solution too. They do my firm's work in-house, even on many of them, even on startups. Um, in, specifically, if I focus, say, sub 5 million, the groups that have really been knocking out of the park over the last few years, you're... Your T rows, they've come down market, they've got a cost effective solution, great deal of investment flexibility, the tech is good. They've done a good job eating up a lot of that market share right now, especially in the TPA community, because they've embraced the value that we believe we bring. Um, the one area of concern I have with two areas, one is how much can they take on? Their implementation has been pushed out significantly. It's no longer a 60-day implementation. You're now looking at 90, 120-day, even on a brand new plan. Is that because they've been they a have been. They have been. So they've raised their pricing a little ways. bit, tried to slow that down. They do outsource their implementation to DST. That was my second worry with them. Um, I have not had any issues with that, quite honestly. 
but it does leave me a little uncomfortable when the client chooses T row and then gets email communications from DST systems saying it's time to set up your plan. And they're not, you know, they're not reaching out as an employee of T row. Um, that has bitten others, by the way, principal, any plan sub 100 employees has to go on what they call simply retirement now. And simply retirement is just a private labeled product of ubiquity. Uh, I believe ubiquity was the old online 401k. And so now every single plan sub 100 with principal goes into that product. Now you can unbundle it with a TPA or you can use ubiquity as the TPA, but it is no longer principal's chassis, it's ubiquity's chassis. That I've had a bunch of issues with so far. Um, hoping that they get that figured it out, but they doubled down. Originally it was only 11 employees and under that needed to go on it. Now it's 100 employees and under have to go on that chassis. Um, so T, T Rose crushing it. Vestwell's doing really well, both in that space and I'll say getting up into that mid market space because the the tech and the integration with different payroll companies, different advisor platforms, different technology like what you're doing with RX, like they've got really good relationships and good people. Um, and as a record keeping product, they're doing very well. And I just think I saw them post about, um, I know just in, in, you know, uh, in chatting and working and, you know, we created a, a, a partnership together and, and I know they were looking for like a director of like enterprise TPA relationship. They just announced, I think like this yeah. unbundled flexibility now some type of program. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little torn, to be honest. I love the commitment. I love the site. I initially thought that this was about distribution. I think the TPA community is great at, at finding opportunities. Um, I took a step back after learning more about what Aaron and team launched. They have come out to the community of TPAs, including us, and said, we want you to work for this price. This is what we believe is reasonable for your services. We'll do all the invoicing to the client. You'll get a portion of what we invoice to the client. You will do the compliance work, but everything will funnel through us, essentially. So outsourcing the compliance work to the TPA community. Um, a different way of going about it. I hadn't, hadn't really thought through that one all that deep. But they don't really give you pricing flexibility where you can value your own services. It's kind of like, it's like in the health, it's like in the healthcare world, it sounds like where, you know, I know I get my, um, I'm dealing with a torn ligament in my foot right apart. now. So my doctor's bills have been off the charts. I'm getting old. Um, but, you know, you get your your um, explanation of benefits or you get, right, it's like the doctor charges this and then the reimbursement rate that the, the carrier has negotiated yeah. with the doctor is this. It sounds like in some ways that might be similar as there's like yeah. a negotiated rate that yeah, that's, exactly. That's so two paths. One, if the referral is coming through Vestwell, if you're one of their TPAs that they're referring the business to, then it's going to be under that relationship. Mm -hmm. But if, if Josh Itzo comes to me with an advisor and that advisor wants to use Vestwell and we do it outside of that, then I can use my own cost structure. So they're controlling cost really for the lead gen perspective where they're delivering basically opportunities for TPAs, not the other way where TPAs are sourcing the business yep. and, and bringing. That's why I thought a distribution was inaccurate other way. with what they're trying to launch. And what I've learned since is there are certain things they can't do. Cross-tested profit sharing, some advanced design, um, dealing with large controlled groups. It's a really common in the micro space right where you where in the microspace where you have closely held businesses and a business owners, maybe their main goal is like, yeah, how do I defer the maximum amount of money I can? For That's about costs? that right there is probably 60% of my consultation time. What you just described right there. What is the most effective design for my company? In my point of view, you have three different types of plans in the microspace from a tax perspective. You have those that are tax positive, meaning the owner and business are saving more in taxes than any cost associated with the plan. Cost being dollars to the employees or operational costs. The second time I'll call tax neutral, meaning plus or minus, we either have some cost or we have some tax savings, but it's a reasonable range to where we as a business owner feel 
that this is still in the best interest of us, the ownership and the business. And we're going to create a plan that's tax efficient, ta tax, tax neutral. Um, or the third, you have an employee benefit plan. You have enough employees, you have enough uh, payroll, that any matching or profit sharing that you're going to give is going to exceed the tax savings that the business is going to get. And we just let the business owner know, yeah, you're going to claw back 100 grand from the IRS, but you're giving 400 grand to your employees. That's a great thing. But it's the cost of doing business. In that case, it's the cost of doing business. Like, hey, this is more about we need to find, hire, and retain to attract. Right? And yeah, you nailed it. Yeah. So in the micro space, yeah. I spend a lot of time having that discussion. What are their objectives and where are we going to land? We're going to be tax positive, tax neutral, or are we going to have an employee benefit plan? Got it. Got it. Let's come back to that because I think there's some things talking from a tax perspective, especially with tax credits now. And even I think we talked about it on Retire Holics, you know, one time as well, just in in terms of if, you know, it's, we'll come back to the tax piece. I, I just want to kind of put a pin on, you know, you mentioned T. Rowe, you mentioned Vestwell. What other providers out there yeah. are seeing that that are doing a, it, a good job moving? And then yeah. that are at well, TPA some, friendly. I mean, Vestwell's not all that TPA friendly yet. T Rose, T Rose, there, getting there. Vestwell's there, getting there. Um, Voya continues to do a really good job in that space. The employee education side and the technology is phenomenal. Their orange dollars and and their uh, engagement tools really help advisors make a meaningful impact. Biggest thing for me with Voya in comparison to any of the other insurance based platforms. Voya will charge a flat billable cost for their services. And so the client gets a deductible expense, potentially helps with the credit if it's a startup. Um, if it's a tax positive plan, that's what we're always looking for is deductible expenses. And it is for the life of the plan. So as that plan grows, much like your vest wells and some of these other disruptors, if you're four grand to Voya, you're four grand to Voya at a million and you're four grand to Voya at two million and you're four grand to Voya at four million. Um, and so they've done a really good job capturing market share because of that simple pricing notes. Yeah, and that's tying really scope of work, right? It, it, it misses, you know, asset-based record keeping fees. Like it has, the work has nothing to do with the amount of assets, it's the number of participants. Um, you know, and if, if it's funny, I, I, some of the stuff I built in the future RX and being able to model out like an asset base versus a, a per participant fee, some really cool functionality called FRX. But, you know, just in think about it, if your ass, if plan assets are growing faster than participants, generally speaking, a per participant fee works better. If participants are growing faster than assets, you know, it's the, uh, you know, it's, it's the other way around. Um, but then that also protects, I think, record keepers, that was always my pitch to them. It's like, look, I know you're addicted to the asset base fees, but let's say you got a company who has a hundred employees and, and acquires another company with a hundred employees. Now there's 200 employees. Well, guess what? Your fees just doubled if you're charging a per participant fee. Yeah. Because you're, you know, the scope of the work doubled. And a lot of providers down market, though, I feel like it's changing. Or more open they're to per participant there. fees. I than think their fear, fees. Josh, is ripping yeah, that yeah. band aid off because they're using the five and ten million dollar plan to subsidize the startup and the five hundred thousand and the one million dollar plan. Where I always tell clients when we're looking at a startup, if they're willing to charge a percentage, like many advisors are too, they're doing pro bono work for the first first few years. Like think about that. They're they're making no money. They're doing a lot of work. There's a lot of tech and effort. And, yeah. Is nothing exactly. Hundred percent of nothing. And so nothing. I, I think platforms that are willing to charge a flat fee or a per participant fee in the startup space, especially, will find some profitability down there that will make them even more competitive in the one, three, five, ten million dollar space because they don't need to subsidize it as much because they're not giving those plans away anymore. Now that that I will tell you, um, that's been a hard conversation for some advisors that focus in that space because they're used to going in with no billable costs. That's what this client came out of uh, paychecks from, you know, or came out of ADP from, they, there was no billable costs. So it was bundled before and they, they were not writing a check for anything. So why do you want me to tell them to write a check? And I said, this comes down to that education. We need to make sure they know why we're doing this. Not only the tax deduction, 
but also the long-term growth. If we can bring the asset charge down from 1% to 50 basis points and have the client take on two grand in billable, that's a win for the employees and a win for the client. Someone's just got to slow down to teach these people that. Yeah. And these people, I'm saying not only the advisor community, but the yeah. plan sponsor community. The advisors need to speak with conviction as to why we're telling the client they should write a check. Yeah. Well, and even being able to model that out, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, on the private wealth side as an example, you know, um, doing things like planning focused strategies like a uh, mega backdoor Roth or a Roth conversion, if you can project that out, like, yeah, you're going to pay more in tax now, but here's what your long-term like tax efficiency is going to be like, you can't control the markets, but you can control yeah. planning strategies like that. And that's, you know, I, I had some of my, you know, some of these small closely held plans where, you know, they were top heavy um, and it was, you know, a small number of, of key employees that had the lion's share of the assets. You know, I, I had actually put together a model that I had done for them. This is going years and years ago, but saying, let us do an analysis for you. Like if you're charging a, not charging a billable, the reality is this, if it's asset based and you have the lion's share of the assets, mm -hmm. you're paying a lion's share of the fees and the fees are reducing the amount of money to compound. So you actually have this compounding cost because you're underwriting a lot of it out of your own, your own accounts. So does it make more sense to pay this as a billable, deduct it, this was even before the credits, deduct it current year and let's model out what's going to be better on your long-term wealth. You may find in, in, and it's got to be the right plan, but you may find that you actually are, are in terms of the assets you can accumulate, it's much better for you to pay that billable yeah. and deduct it as an expense and get that inflated, you know, cost. I, I just took notes. Your assets. Do you find I, yeah, and I just took notes happening? of compounding cost because I've never used that term in that specific part of the conversation. I love that. That's good. What I tend to do is tell them if you have more than 60% of the assets, most of our clients are in rough with that 40% tax bracket. If you have more than 60% of the assets, you're better off taking on a build expense than you are an asset-based cost because for every dollar, you're going to get a 40% credit back from the IRS yeah. essentially saying, hey, you created a deduction here. Um, the thought of it compounding year over year is is good. It's not something I've talked about, and uh, and I love I love that thought. But yeah, the, that conversation's happening. You could build. We just would build. We would build like a personal projection for them, and yeah. model out just the two scenarios. Um, you know, it takes a little bit of work, but now you're talking about value added discussions. You, you know that that why in that that space by far probably the most trusted business advisor mm -hmm. is typically the CPA, not the auditor, yeah. but the tax accountant. Because the tax accountant is showing value add of like, hey, you're gonna spend 100K, but if you do that, you're gonna save 500K. And that's why they, that's a, when you can start to talk about deeper level consulting like that, I just think you put yourself into a the number of clients I air. speak to in that micro space, Josh, that have a tax preparer versus a tax consultant, which is the term you just used, is remarkable. So many of them say, "Oh, I don't talk to my tax preparer. I just send them the stuff, and and they prepare my taxes and send it back to me." Like that, you're, that is a disservice to you. You're leaving opportunity and dollars on the table. If you speak with a tax consultant, they'll give you ideas every year. They'll say, "Hey, it's time to buy another truck, or it's time to do this." because they know your personal situation and what is beneficial for you. Completely agree. Yeah, it's tax, yeah. It's tax prep versus tax planning. And you can bring that with these small, you know, closely held businesses and plans as the advisor, like you can bring, and you're not gonna give tax advice, but you can bring in some of those tax planning, consulting yeah. strategies. I know you want to, to table really this one for later, but we hopped right back from vendors to, to tax planning. So I'm going to make one more point and then we can go back if you'd like. The, the conversations that we have in the micro space are very different than the, from a tax planning perspective than those in the small, mid-large space. 
I'll give you one simple example that I think often is overlooked. And as you likely know, in the 401k world, eligible compensation, eligible pay for an S-corp business owner. Most of these small businesses are structured as an S-corp. The eligible pay is only their W-2. Yeah. Their, their owner draw, their distribution, their K-1 does not count for plan co compensation. And so often what we do is we sit down with them and, and I'll say, hey, you're taking 100 grand in income right now. I want to boost your, your W-2 to 200,000. And they're like, no, 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 no. My, my, my tax consultant tells me to keep my W-2 as low as possible because I save in, save in self-employment tax. And then I quantify it for them, just like you did. I said, look, you're going to take a little bit of Social Security. You're going to take some Medicare on. So you're going to pay an extra $11,000 in taxes to bump up your pay. But in doing so, not only can we shelter more for you, but your cost and contribution to your employees in order to allow you to maximize on the 401k. You were giving them 40 grand. Now you're giving them 20. So not only did you save more, but you also brought down what you have to give to the employees by $20,000. And net net, this is what I think many consultants fail to do. Don't show the client percentages that they're getting. Oh, you're getting 58% of the company contribution or 62 or, or 91. Show them dollars and make it freaking green dollars. and big. Show them, look, this is what you're ahead by doing this. You, you just saved an extra $18,000 that is now in your account in your pocket, in your company, versus out the doors to the IRS right now. And that, that hits home when you show them dollars. It really does. And if you look at the industry, all of our tech, all of our software shows percentages. I hate it. I still have not found a good one out there, which is why we take everything that we produce and put it into our own, uh, you know, our own t uh, push out technology, our own interface. Um, it's got to be shown in dollars. You know, it's interesting. So, you know, I about a month ago launched, um, I, I won a ton of business around fees. Like that was my calling card, like cost optimization for plans. And I had a whole way of visualizing it where, and um, that was just very, 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 very different. And I have built basically the things I used to do in Excel and PowerPoint and Word that would take me a bunch of time is now this what's called FRX within fiduciary RX and, and advisors are like losing their mind over. It's very yeah. cool the way it visualizes the conversation around fees, but there's one total cost projection module where you can like put in current proposed, you can assign growth rates. It does like 10 year projections of cost. It's very slick, but on the report, it's got like the assumptions and then it itemizes record keeping and admin fund and advisory expenses and percentages current versus proposed. But I tell everybody the second, the page behind that, it actually breaks it out in dollars. Nobody knows when you say, Hey, we think we can save you 20 basis points, what that means. But if you say, we think we can save you 50 grand. Um, yeah. Numbers are visceral. Talk about dollars. It quantifies it in a way that percentages or basis points, like nobody knows what the heck a basis point. Heck, it took me when I got into the business, it took me <laughs> a month to figure out what a basis point actually was. I don't know what that is. So I love what you're saying around you put it at people can understand dollars. And even what you're talking about, like those dollars, those dollars can get big. And then think about like, if you really want to take a next level, hey, what's that $18,000 yep. compounded at? six or seven percent over the next 15 years or 20 years or 30 years yeah and even outside that of the growth that eighteen thousand in year one on a million dollar plan is now twenty two thousand in year two on a 1.3 million dollar plan and then that continues to go up as well it's it's a good point and that spread now we flipped from tax efficiency to cost i always tell people those two things tie really well together um, a same with rate of return, in my opinion, it yeah. needs to be tied into that conversation as well. Now, the industry is really levelized, right? Back in the day when we wanted to set up an institutional lineup with an advisor, there were only a handful of, of products that we could go out and get true institutional level investing or open architecture. Now, I mean, some of the other groups that are doing great in that micro, Hancock has it, Trans has it. You know, most of these groups have true institutionalized investing at a, you know, a Z share and institutional and admiral share type of share class. Right. Right. 
And that's what we typically see, right, is that you, you get these innovations, large market, and then they it takes time, but they kind of roll down. You yeah, know, you're, you're, you're near a coaster. I always time. say now that I live in the center of the country, whatever happens in California or New York or D.C., or it takes a while to get into here. I see it happening on the outsides. I'm like, all right, it'll be here yeah. soon. People will care about this soon. But it, uh, it takes a while. And same thing in the small space. What yeah. happens up market tends to dribble down. To your point earlier, though, I don't think litigation is going that way. I, I totally, I totally agree. Um, but I think, you know, the key, this is, I mean, I've, you've seen me post it on LinkedIn. Like I, I got in the habit early on to read every um, complaint that was filed. They're like 80 pages long. A lot of them are kind of look the same, but you can learn while litigation can't, I don't think is rolling down, you know, um, yeah. the lessons you can learn from what those plans should be doing or are doing or not doing, you can actually bring those down. Like you can have lessons learned from litigation with a $5 million client. Hey, here's what's happening. Here's what the best run plans or the worst run plans are doing or not doing. Let's take the learnings and we're gonna implement those best practices for your plan. That was part of my pitch down market was we're gonna bring in a, lar a mid to large market institutional consulting philosophy and we're gonna give you access yeah. to that at a plan of your size. So, so don't ignore, if you're in the small market, don't ignore learn. what's happening up market. That can get into your talk track to learn, to educate, to your point earlier, which is a great one. An educated client by far is the best client. It's gonna build trust between you. A lot of times, like the education, it's not just one time. A lot of advisors, I think they're like, oh, I talked about that one time. Like a lot of times you have to go back and remind over and over and over again. Um, you know, to make the stickiness increase. What are some of the in selling in that market? I mean, even today, 401k plans are not bought, they are sold. Like, yeah. and I don't mean that negatively, but it's, it's you, you have, whether it's up market or down market, you have unsophisticated buyers. They don't know what they don't know. You know, maybe they download an RFP off of, you know, the internet and then maybe they ask the right questions, but they don't know how to interpret the answers appropriately. And that education piece is so important. What are some of like maybe your best ideas in terms of uh, selling into that market? Analogies you use, stories. Yeah. How do you make uh, the complex simple? Chat? I love that question, and it's something you've heard from time to time. Me ask on retire hall. when I have brains like you or Nevin or, or Fred Reich or you name them sitting with us. That's what I always want to know. How, how do you explain these topics that have made you successful when others have failed to do so? And so I think as an industry, we should do more of this type of sharing. Um, I tend to break it down in two ways. And we've done this for years. The first is I try to change commonly used terms. I mentioned earlier, instead of compensation, I use pay. I, I asked JD's daughter, who I think is 26, um, if she knew what that term meant, she's like, I have no clue. What's my compensation? I don't, I don't know. I'm like, well, what do you get paid? Oh, okay. This is what I get paid. And the truth is so many businesses don't know that either. Another one, ADP test. It's, it stands for actual deferral percentage test. Just change the damn word from actual to average. It is an average, right? We're looking at an average of people's deferrals. So I use average in that scenario. I, I interchangeably use words and every year, we sit down as a sales team and we go through our most commonly used words and our most commonly used topics and we come up with new analogies for them. If something's really working, like right now we've been stuck on our home builder analogy. Um, we used to use a sports analogy with this, but when someone asks us to tell, tell them what we do, I've got an advisor sitting here, maybe there's a record, what do we do? I always put them in a good frame of mind. Imagine you're building your dream home. And you're excited about this. One of the first people you tend to engage with is a general contractor. That is not the person putting up the drywall or the plumbing in the wall or laying your foundation. But that is the person that knows all of those independent contractors, all of those groups to come in, the right people that are going to do a good job for you. They are your advocates, that contractor is. Well, that's your advisor in the 401k space. The next person you tend to meet with if you're building your home is an architect. Someone that sees your vision. 
Do you have kids? Do you not? Do you like to entertain? Do you want a kegerator out back? Do you like to swim? What kind of pool setup? Do you like to cook? Do we need a, a you know, restaurant style stovetop? That is the TPA. My job is to understand the vision and design the home to meet the lifestyle that they're going to live. Design the 401k plans to meet their objectives and get them as much flexibility as possible moving forward as they go through the different stages of their life. Now, they might have kids now, but those kids aren't going to live there in 25 years. So we need to make sure that that home, that plan is constructed in a way that gives flexibility. And then the third part of that analogy is, is the record keeper. If I build this home, the home needs to be livable. You need to have TV on the wall. You need to have silverware in the drawers and, and cups in the cabinets and sheets on the bed. That's what our record keepers do. They're the interface that connects the operations of the plan and the money to you and your individual employees. They make the plan operable. And so that kind of analogy, we that started off as a sports analogy. We used to do the team doctor, the NFL, and the coach. Um, we sit down every year. We look through those types of conversations, and we come up with better examples. My other favorite one that I've started using, businesses, when they go to add a company contribution, they always struggle with the fact that they are legally required to give something to the employees. The thought is, as a business owner, we're doing really well. You I mean, my cat, when I research on Google, says 57000 So, you know, I can just put some money at sixty one. I can just put money in my own account, right? Well, well no, you can't. And the example I use is you're, you're on a teeter-totter, right? And right now, when we put a bunch of money in your account, it sits like this. The IRS doesn't say that you have to sit level or you don't have to give so much to your employees that we tilt the other way. What it says is we've got to give enough away from you and to the employees that it lifts you off the ground. You can't have the employee base be on the ground when you're teeter-tottering up nice and high. And so what do we need to do? Instead of giving money to the IRS, we carve out a way to give some money to your hardworking employees. And my goal is to design a plan where you give less to the employees than what you would have given to the IRS. And in the micro space, they love that thought. You mean I get to reward my employees with a great match or great non-elective contribution? I get to give them money and I can do so in a way that doesn't cost me anything because I'm saving more in taxes? The, taking the complicated and making it simple is really what helps the small market plan win. Be sold to your term earlier. Yeah, I, I used to call it give to get. That's how these plans are set up. You got to give to get. And it's fun, so funny, the teeter-totter. I was going to mention, you beat me to it, Jim Sampson from Hill. That's the analogy he uses, right? As he's like, you know, you got the big kids on one side, you got the little kids on huh. the other side. You got to make sure that like both both kids get a chance, you know, when he was talking about discrimination yeah. testing, like nobody, you know, um, ACP, right? It's just about, you know, you got to make sure it's fun for the big kids and the little kids on the teeter-totter. So similar to the way that, that you know, that you're describing it. Um, what, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing out in the yeah, marketplace? The, I think specifically right in the micro space, the number one issue that exists is the payroll companies are holding on to everything as tightly as they possibly can. We talked earlier about operational errors. Most of those come from the way we're handling the contribution process in a plan. Calculating the match, calculating the deferral, changes in deferral not being implemented in time. All of that comes from the holy grail, right? It comes from the payroll and your ADP, your paychecks, and there's a few others that are out there that also offer 401k solutions. They don't want to play with the record, the 401k record keepers. They don't want to share that data cleanly. And so the biggest issue, because they have the majority of the market on the payroll, but they don't have the majority of the market in the retirement plan space, although they have a fair share, they will not send over data feeds to the likes of your Hancocks and your T-Rows and your, your principals. And, um, and so that's an issue, right? When I go in and consult with a client, having that conversation of, you're, you're failing to run your plan accurately and it's because people are processing payroll changes and that's not getting uploaded to the record keeper or someone someone went ahead and requested a loan and that information didn't get into payroll because they requested it through the record keeper. All of these things exist and, and they shouldn't. They shouldn't. There should be some sort of, of forced relationship between the client's payroll data and that technology and what can be shared with the investment provider. Now, there are a couple of companies that are doing that. There's a couple of good ones out there, 
that create an intermediary that simply log into payroll, validate accuracy of all that information, upload it on the client's behalf because our paychecks, ADPs, and some others won't share the information. But that still leaves some, some room for error when you have uh, no direct feed of that data. That's the biggest issue in the micro space. And, and actually, you know, who's, who's, you know, then you get payroll who's pointing the finger at record keep the record keeper and the record keeper is pointing the finger at payroll. But the reality is it's the in the eyes of the law, it's the client who gets the, you know, you know, they're, they're the ones who, um, you know, it's kind of like the litigation environment right now, right? You're starting to see record keepers get named and you're starting to see advisors kind of come up in complaints. There's a little bit of litigation, but it, like the end of the day, <laughs> The plan sponsor is the one that's like in the crosshairs. Um, what do you think is going to, you know, so, so it's basically the client who's getting screwed. The plan sponsor is getting screwed and all of this. If they're, if they're vendors they're working with won't play nice in the sandbox with each other. It's yeah. the client who's getting the shaft, you know? Yeah. Um, and so what do you think it's going to take to force these companies to, start to be better partners and not just, you know, blame one another and point the finger at one another and leave the client in the cloth. The you know, I alluded to it a little bit earlier, just as a whole in the micro space, we continue to build technology that's good for the industry and not technology that's necessarily good for the client. That's my personal opinion. And I think the same thing exists in this relationship, right? The, the payroll companies are trying to build a business and I get it. I'm a business owner. I said, they're building a business that is good for them. We want to retain the relationship. We want to do the group health. We want to do the 401k. We want to do the payroll. And so they don't want loose ends, but that to your, is not in the best interest of the client. So what is it going to take? It's going to take us as an industry putting a, a, a foot down and it's going to take clients saying, I'm not doing business with you unless you create an open API, unless you allow access for, for my 401k provider. And I know we can't do it with every small market payroll and every small market 401k provider, but the big names, your ADP and paychecks, if they would communicate with your fidelities, your empowers, your principals, your, your nationwides and Hancocks and Voyas, like if they would communicate with the big players, that would solve probably 85% of the relationship issues that exist there. Now, the truth too, this has been a while since I got this stat, so forgive me if it's outdated. I saw... Average client retention for a 401k space provider is, is around eight years. Average 401k client retention for ADP paychecks was around 18 months. And that's because they can be good at payroll pro providing, but they're not necessarily good 401k providers. And now that client wants to get out. They want to move their 401k over. So that, that 18 months, what you're saying is where they're also doing the 401k because payroll I mean, at the end of the day, payroll yeah. is what drives that. that I, when, when people are not, they are less inclined. It's kind of like your banking relationship, right? Like why do banks, and they want you using more services and like you got your automatic, you know, you got your direct deposit set up. You may have your bill pay set up. The pain to leave your bank, like the, the, the switching costs, yeah. like you gotta be in massive pain because the he headache and the hassle and I got it like it's got to be really really they know they got absolutely it. and I think that's the same with payroll like a payroll conversion is a nightmare um and so they're kind of in this position where they're taking it they could be taking advantage of the fact that they know they kind of got you know they got smart kind of business on there kind of let's, hairs, let's, let's acknowledge will. that right right who are some of the the, the payroll companies that you're seeing are there there are smaller, um, more nimble, more maybe tech focused payroll companies that are out there that are exploiting kind of that dissatisfaction? Yeah, with so the, payroll only with the payroll um, and HRS type services are the groups that we tend to partner most with. Um, your Paylocity has been doing a great job, Ceridian, a few of those. There's also a lot of regional groups. Um, there's an AccuCheck and and some others that are doing a really good job in that space. And then you have your, your true outsource HRs, your Gustos and others that I think are doing a really good job disrupting that the conversation that we're having right here saying, hey, 
it's not our data, it's yours. We'll create as long as it's a secured, safe, from a, from a tech standpoint, a group that we can work with and we're comfortable, we'll create links with all of them. It's an open API. We'll write code to communicate out. And so some of those, especially Paylocity, has been really open to establishing those relationships and building out. You know what I've learned, Josh, too, in lifting up that hood? Many of those payroll companies aren't using their own tech. They're using timestamp systems provided by a Kronos or some of the other large uh, payroll software companies. Exactly. And so if I learned this specifically through a couple of payroll mm -hmm. integration teams we built out with Voya, where Voya came and said, hey, I get it. You don't have a 360 with us, but you're using Kronos for all your timestamp systems. It's their data. We've already built one with them so we can backdoor it. We don't have to we don't have to spend a big a big build on creating this relationship. And so advisors need to to look under the hood a little bit and don't just go with what the salesperson's telling you. Find out what that system's operating on because often that relationship is already built with the major record keepers. Wow, that, that's super interesting. Um, as we wrap up here, you know, I know we've talked about this a little bit, um, and I've heard you guys on the show before. Um, what do you see advisors in the micro market? Um, how are they deploying tech? Um, are they doing that? Are they just relying on record keepers or on you guys? And they're really more just the face kind of showing up. Like what, what, what are you seeing in the, um, in kind of that yeah. micro space with advisors, their both appetite and aptitude around leveraging tech to help. Let me silo it real quick service. into three spots. You've got, your your RIA community that has backing, like call it an LPL that has backing from their tech. And and those folks, even if they're not 401k focused, are using some of that uh, backend technology to support clients. You have your broker dealer groups, your Morgan, your Merrill's, your UBS. They're leveraging some of their technology, um, much lesser scale than the independents. And then you have, I'll call your insurance groups. And we do a lot with those groups that don't have any technology built around the 401k. And they're solely using the record keeping tools that are provided. So those three silos, I would say as a whole, they're all embracing the record keeping tools, which is why most of the, the, the families that I mentioned, the Morgans, the Merrills, they limit the record keepers that their advisors can work with because they know not only do they have a, they don't have a selling relationship at all, they, the advisors need that tech to properly service the client. Now, why? Why do I think they're only willing to use the record keeping side of thing, things? Because they haven't found a way to make the microspace profitable. If it was profitable, they would be willing to spend money for something like a fiduciary RX or some of the other tools that are out there for employee engagement. Um, they don't want to spend that money because they don't have a big enough book and they can't be profitable in that space. It doesn't justify this. The investment doesn't justify. Right. And where I spend my time, and this basis. is why I've been such a big believer in the work that you've been doing, is I tell these these folks that have 10 plans or 15 plans, don't think of about of it as an expense. Think about the amount of time you're going to save, the amount of effort that you're going to save by utilizing these tools. And that frees you up to go get another private wealth client or to go get another group health client if 401k isn't the focal point. So you already have 10 or 15 groups. you got to service those groups. Yeah. That 10 or 15 with HR turnover, that, that could be 15 or 20 pretty quickly. Now that you have 15 or 20, you're on the, 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 the accounts, the TPAs, the record keepers. They're going to start bringing you in to an opportunity once in a while. Now 15 or 20 is now 25 or 30. Once you get over that 10 plan threshold, it tends to grow pretty quick. And that's where I tell advisors, you need to have a little expense in the tech that you're using and it will pay off just in time saved, let alone the new opportunities you'll bring on. Yeah, yeah it is interesting. You mentioned the private wealth. There's a lot of great FinTech in the private wealth space and a lot of private wealth RIAs have, it, it's funny, they, private wealth tends to view technology as an investment. Huh. Retirement plan advisors tend to view technology as an expense and um, I, you know, obviously I have a biased opinion in this, but I do think retirement plan advisors need to start thinking about make tech your next hire, right? Retirement plan advisors, because there's not, 
you know, there's 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 some good tools that are out there, not just Fiduciary X, but but you know, you've got the the FI three sixties and the RPAGs and the plan tools and the fiduciary decisions. Those are tools. Like you, you need to have tools in your toolbox, right? If you're gonna be a carpenter, like, you know, you you, you know, you you need to come out of the stone age. Um, but you need to view it as an investment. And so many retirement plan advisors, either they leverage, you know, like a record keepers. Well, guess what? You don't have any brand uh, strength if you're leveraging that. But the other thing is doing all these things manually. And I, I think advisors need to really understand the Absolutely. Value of their time. Sometimes advisors, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll spend a dollar to save a nickel. And like to your point, how do you be smart about your tech stack? I'm not, I'm not just talking about what I build, but, but across the board and use it as an investment. In, in some cases, you may be able to make tech your next hire, which is gonna be a heck of a lot less expensive than going, number one, finding somebody in this environment, two, what you gotta pay them, three, the time you have to take and then to if train they turn them, over, you know, Yeah, also um, true and don't, when I meet these advisors that have 10 or 15 plans and they're spread out amongst eight record keepers, and I will admit fault, JD will tell you, when I first came on board, we were doing the majority of our business with about five or six record keepers. And I'm like, why? I'm going to go out there and sell with everybody and anybody. Any, if I think it fits a record keeper, I'm going to take it. Next thing I know. Make it efficient and scalable yeah. when you've got a ton of record keeping relationships. All that, you could take that from the large market. All these large teams, what are they doing? Like they'll work, you know, they may have 18 or 20 record keepers they've got business with, but 80% yeah. is going to be with the five or six relationships because you get dedicated resources, you get a de dedicated client experience, yep. you get efficiencies. It, the, you can't scale when you've got. And I get it. In the micro space, many of those advisors are it. going, I just need to get the plan done and, and move on to the other line of servicing I'm trying to help them with. And I'm like, I understand what you're trying to say, but we need to talk about your service model, your ability to help this client. And on the back end, if you're yeah. trying to run a fiduciary review for 10 plans a year from now or two years from now, and you've got eight different record keeper tools that you're using and different call centers, that you're trying to get a poll of that annual contract review and your information from the testing. over. You are going to sink your ship very quickly. No wonder you can't be profitable in that space. Like spend some time. Well, and then, yeah, well, and the other thing too is it's hard to deliver a, a, a consistent Very client true. experience. Yeah, great point. That's the key. You want to be referable, deliver a consistent client experience. So I can't believe, like, you know, as, as we kind of wrap up, it's, see, this has gone by, and I could talk to you for two or three more hours. Um, as we wrap up, and, and, you know, obviously, I feel like, just about everybody in the industry knows you, knows, you know, retireholics, um, probably knows retireholics, sometimes may know that actually plan design, you know, consultants is the, the, the you know, is the stock, straw that stirs the drink there. But what's your biggest piece of advice for advisors? Doing this for so long, being successful, what you've seen, if you could, if you could give your single best piece of advice for the current market environment and what you're seeing. Yeah, that's a good be? one. I mean, my initial reaction when you asked that was back to the point we were just making, which is spend a little bit of time determining what your offering is. You said your niche earlier. I'm going to go a little bit past that and just say, well, how do you how do you win service and retain that niche? Spend a little bit of time figuring out what your offering is, what your elevator pitch might be, how you're going to service the client, what tools are you going to engage? Because in the long run, it's going to make you far more effective. It's going to lead to a cohesive client experience and in all likelihood lead to some referrals because you are doing a good job. That was my my initial response. And then as soon as I thought about that, my next reaction was freaking care. Like don't, in the 401k space, too many people are doing it as a byproduct of the relationship. Like I golf with this person or I go to church with that person. You need to care about this client. You need to care about their employees. You need to really do what is right for them. Don't just sell the plan and depend upon the record keeper to take care of everything or the TPA to take care of everything. Get out there. See the client in year two. See the client in year three. Coordinate an education meeting. Help one-on-one. -on -one. Find a way to make that profitable even better, but, but give a shit. 
Go spend some time caring about it. They really care about the private well. They spend time in the market. Many of them, I ask, hey, you want to go get lunch? Oh, I can't go get lunch till the market closes. Okay, fair enough. That's your model. Have you thought about spending any, any amount of time on your 401k clients and how you're servicing them? Because spending time paying attention to the market usually is not it. You're not day trading their 401k plans. You're not even making investment changes every quarter. So I guess my second reaction was care. Just care. Yeah, so if I could summarize what you just said, I think one, it is get really clear around your core purpose and what you believe, and then spend some time working yeah, on your absolutely. business, not just in your business. Yeah, well, Chad, thank this you. has been a blast. Love you, brother. I'm, uh, glad we could finally make this happen. I think you brought some, just as I expected, and knew that you brought just some really intelligent insights um, and just have a ton of respect for you and for the whole team and what you guys are doing. And this has been a ton of fun. we got to do it again at some point. And uh, uh, where can everybody catch up with you? I'll make sure to put it in the so show notes, but what's the best way? Yeah, to keep best way is, is with, via uh, email or you? phone. I mean, reach out to me. I'm. That's one thing that I think gets uh, misconstrued often. They think that Retireholics takes up so much time that we're not in the day business, which is the TPA side of it. Truth is, about 98% of my time is on the day business. JD, the production team, they all handle the retireholics. We show up, we, we uh, spend time thinking about the topics and learning, uh, but all of that leads to value on the day business. So all, all of my time and effort is spent on plan design consultants, the efforts that we're trying to create a better industry there. Um, so yeah, and you can follow us on LinkedIn, follow me on LinkedIn. You can find Retireholics on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Uh, we push out stuff every day, pretty much just trying to, to help people stay more in touch with the 401k space. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for doing all that you're all right, doing. All right, brother. Back I've got, I've got, got a finals in 12 get minutes. Get back to work. So. You got, uh... All right, man. You all take right. care, Josh. Thank you. Sounds good, bro. Amen. Hey,